Hello everyone, this is Tom. I hope you're doing well. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the second canto of Purgatorio. It's a canto full of music. It's a, it's a canto about music and about singing. In uh, Purgatorio we're gonna see a ton of praying and singing and music, but in this canto in particular Dante is talking to us about music as well and uh, the value that it has, uh, both positive, especially positive, but also the uh, with a, an interpretation of uh, obstacle and destruction that it can sometimes have. Very interesting take that comes from his uh, uh, previous work, uh, Il Convivio, as well. The canto can be divided or split in three main parts. The first part is the arrival of the angelic boat with the souls. The second part is the interaction between the angelic souls, Dante and Virgil, and uh, the feelings and, and sentiments that they share in, in terms of being two parties, Virgil and Dante and uh, all the angelic souls are, that have arrived. And finally, the encounter with Casella, who is the, the singer an old friend of Dante who will sing and uh, um, capture everyone's attention for uh, uh, a really beautiful moment of, uh, of this canto. I find it a little bit uh, strange that uh, Dante uses so many lines at the beginning of this canto to basically say the concept that it was six in the morning. is. Uh, Instead of saying it was six in the morning, he gives us a medieval astronom astronomy um, explanation, which it's uh, I consider it interesting for for what it is historically interesting. But uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, research that is easily easily available on digital Dante in particular by Teodolinda Barolini from Columbia University, in case you want to go a little bit deeper on, on this particular matter. But I'm summarizing the first uh, three tercets as it was six in the morning. Um, Virgil and Dante are still along the shore and uh, they are finding themselves like those who think about the journey they will undertake, who go in heart, but in the body stay. Very, very interesting description of a feeling that we, we all have felt sometimes, and we still feel some days, where there is a certain hesitation, a sense of uh, maybe indecision, or there's a lot of thinking, but we haven't really taken real action on our, on our thoughts. And this particular expression, Dante had already used it almost in the identical formulation that we can find here in his uh, Vita Nova, the book where he talks about uh, the new life that was inspired to him by Beatrice and the vision that he had for anybody who's interested, and maybe if you, if you do have the Vita Nova uh, book by Dante, um, you can go on chapter 13, uh, line number or paragraph number 6, and you can find it. It's a uh, in all of this anti-purgatory or anti-purgatorio, there is this sense of hesitancy and uh, the spiritual uh, meaning that Dante is uh, alluding to is uh, a, a certain spiritual inertia, a spiritual inertia that uh, uh, can that we all can be victim of, big victims of, uh, whenever we know what to do, you, we know what the right thing to do is, and we actually even want to do it, but we just don't do it. Or maybe we take time before before taking action. This is the uh, suffused sentiment all around the anti-purgatory, before purgatory proper. And so this particular quotation here has a, a very precise meaning here. And just as Mars, when it's overcome by the invading mists of dawn, glows red above the water plane. If you look through this first, uh, maybe one third of the canto and try to maybe highlight or circle the words that indicate color, 
You're going to see there's so many. There's a lot of them. There is white, vermil, it's uh, orange, red, um, reddening, white, white, whiteness. A lot of this, uh, the fact that it is mainly red and white, which uh, in the Christian tradition have a certain meaning in themselves, also adds some type, some more meaning to, to the work. But uh, what interests me is uh, the big striking visual difference from Inferno, where we've, we've seen almost no colors at all, only darkness and absence of light. Here we start to see a lot of uh, color adjectives and descriptions of bright colors. So um, just like when uh, Dante says when Mars is uh, very close to the horizon and it looks red and there's vapors around it, so um, at a certain point Dante sees this white little light that is crossing the sea. In fact, uh, Mandelbaum he is here um, translates as a light that crossed the sea so swift that there is no flight or bird to equal it. It's beautiful. Um, however, on the original side, I read uh, this uh, little light um, was coming through the sea uh, so so quickly. So it wasn't crossing the sea, it was coming through the sea. And uh, it gives you, I think, a better sense of Dante's point of view and this little point of light that is, in fact, rushing towards him straight. And obviously this is this uh, the angelic boat, the angel. I thought here that maybe Mandelbaum was uh, either making a particular translation choice or potentially even struggling a little bit because his version from verse 22 goes, then to each side of it I saw a whiteness, so I did not know what the whiteness was. Below another whiteness slowly showed. My master did not say a word before the whitenesses first started. It feels a little bit redundant, feels a little bit too much, but maybe Mandelbaum didn't have a lot of good alternatives because on the original side, the same part, um, for the same part, Dante only uses uh, the word bianco, which means white, uh, twice. And it's a little bit more uh, balanced overall. The reference to Mars in particular, is very important here because um, Mars and uh, the circle of Mars in uh, um, Dante's world, in his uh, astronomical and also astrological vision, uh, Mars is the circle of uh, music, and uh, the and, and this is the ca the canto of music. So uh, the, the the fact that he's quoting Mars in a simile again is not uh, random at all. He's, uh, he's referring to Mars and, uh, and, and referring us to a canto in Paradiso where he will talk about Mars and the power of music, the glorifying power of music. What is without a doubt is that in this canto, Dante is making a huge and explicit comparison between the angel of God, who is uh, transporting the souls to purgatory, and Charon, whom we saw in Canto III of Inferno. There are many uh, specific references to Charon, not only the color white of his long beard, the, the orb that he was using, the fact that his boat was going. There's a lot of uh, pointers that say to us that Dante is uh, again doing this type of game of uh, referencing other cantos in a vertical way and putting them aside for a stronger poetic, poetic effect, the comparison between the roughness of Charon, the roughness with which Charon treats the souls, and uh, the, the grace of the angel is very special. So with the same uh, coldness with which he arrived, the angel of God goes away and goes back to Ostia, at the mouth of the Tiber, where he is uh, picking up new souls and every time bringing them back to the shore of Purgatory. It's, uh, it's interesting here because it's the first time that Dante uh, feels like he is uh, blinded by the light of divine grace. And this particular element uh, will repeat itself in Purgatory many times and many, many times in Paradiso. The light obviously being a symbol of the divine grace, a symbol of God, 
And uh, from a point of view of a sinner, depending how serious and how grave the sin of the sinners are, uh, the, um, the, the eyes will not be able to contain this light. And so in this particular case, we see in, on verse uh, um, 37, 38, as he drew closer and closer to us, seemed to gain in brightness so that my eyes could not endure his nearness and I was forced to lower them. That's, uh, that's what Dante means here. Now, here there is a bit of a debate, historic debate, among uh, Dante commentators about verse uh, 44. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm really curious to know what other translators or other translations uh, make of this verse, which on, uh, in Mandelbaum sounds, uh, at the stern, seem to have blessed blessedness inscribed upon him. In Italian, tal che parea beato per iscripto. Um, how does your translation uh, translate this, this verse? Because it's, uh, it might have one or two or even three different uh, interpretations. Um, we, could see, we could say that the angel um, was to seem blessed by inscription, or maybe inscription referred to the Bible. Um, or potentially it could mean that uh, he had some type of inscription upon him of blessedness. I'm just uh, curious to know what other options there are out there and what's, what else has been uh, translated and published. And in his boat he had more than a hundred spirits uh, sitting with him. Uh, at the same time, one hundred is the number of God. Uh, but also when Dante says more than a hundred, he also means uh, a huge number of no particular definition, no specification. First song that we find in the canto, In Exitu Israel de Egipto. A uh, very beautiful psalm. This is actually Psalm 114 in the Jewish tradition uh, of how psalms are uh, numerated, are numbered in, uh, in the Book of Psalms. And uh, it is a beautiful psalm. The, the souls here are singing it because it's a pilgrimage psalm. It's a, it's a, it's a psalm that reminds uh, them, reminds us, of uh, the people of Israel's uh, exit from Egypt, traditionally, uh, biblically, uh, but also the fact that Egypt, uh, in the Bible it's itself, later on in the Old Testament, symbolizes sin. Therefore, the souls are exiting the, the world of sin, and they're coming out of sin and they're ready to be purified in purgatory and then to be saved. Here I have a, a book about the Psalms um, explained and commented by Bishop Gianfranco Ravasi, who's a famous archbishop in Italy, Italian archbishop, uh, very knowledgeable about uh, uh, biblical, biblical interpretation. And uh, Psalm 114, about the exit from Israel is uh, special because uh, it gives us uh, almost uh, grandiose images uh, when talking about uh, the exit of uh, the Israel people from Egypt. Um, the meaning of which uh, should give us the sense of something that is very revolutionary. The world is uh, upside down. The world is changing completely. Uh, black is white and white is black. Because, he says, whenever this happened, the Red Sea, of course, uh, escaped. Uh, the Jordan, the River Jordan, went back, changed its course. The Lord, who is uh, changing the mountain in uh, a sea, in a lake, and the rock in a spring of clear water. Very lyrical. The entire Book of Psalms contains some of the very best poetry. The souls arrive on the beach, they look around, there is a beautiful image of the sun that's still rising, and so, like arrows, the sun rays are uh, going around like uh, <clears throat> and illuminating the entire landscape. And the souls address uh, Virgil and Dante and say, asking for directions. So here is the first time where Virgil has to be very honest and says, we're not experts here, we don't know exactly where we need to go, uh, even if I'm supposed to guide this guy. 
he gives them a little bit of a summary of their own journey using the same precise words that Dante used in Inferno 1 when he talked about uh, the woods. Aspra e forte. I'm talking about uh, verse 65. Mandelbaum translates as uh, We came but now a little while before you, though another by another path so difficult and dense. These difficult and dense are in Italian aspra e forte and are the same two words that Dante referred to the dark woods at the very beginning of, of the poem. Um, it's going to be, and, and Virgil once again makes a judgment mistake. He says, uh, from here, you know, after what we've gone through, going up uh, Mount Purgatory is going to be like a play, a child's, child's play. And, and he's wrong. <laughs> he will uh, realize uh, that he's wrong later on. But it's always about uh, his role as uh, uh, a stranger. In fact, something really fascinating about Virgil here is that we finally understand in Purgatorium, Purgatorium how his role is more complex than what we think. He's not simply a guide or simply an allegory of uh, rationality, etc. He is also a character. He is also Virgil, Virgil himself. And throughout Purgatory in particular, he's there to guide Dante, yes, but he's also there to learn, to learn himself. And we, we will see that. One of his souls uh, comes near Dante and it's really moving with how much um, joy and happiness they, the two of them recognize each other, Dante and his friend Casella. Casella, um, historically, we really don't know much about Casella. He was a famous singer, but we don't, we're not even sure if he was from Florence, from uh, Pistoia, or maybe even from Siena. In any case, um, he was uh, part of a certain type of elite group because Dante himself was, and so Dante knew him, he had seen as some type of uh, either parties, conferences, events, and uh, and also Dante himself was not only a politician but also a poet, and therefore he had a, a, a foot in the arts world uh, to the point that he had put uh, some musical, some music in uh, um, words, or the opposite happened. Uh, singers like Casella had put in music some of Dante's canzonis or Dante's poems, like we will see. So the first reaction, the first uh, spontaneous reaction from both of them is to hug each other. Casella knows better, but Dante doesn't, and uh, he tries to hug him, but he realizes that Casella is just a soul, a spirit, and so he tries three times, and for three times he just hugs the air. Uh, a really curious scene that uh, is not original in Dante, because he took it from the Aeneid. In fact, there are two scenes in the Aeneid, just like this one. And uh, commentators have uh, fought and wrestled about which one Dante was thinking about. I don't think it really matters much, but uh, uh, a very powerful one was the one where um, Aeneas uh, is trying to hug his father Anchises in, uh, in the Aeneid. Verse 83 is showing us something else that's uh, new and uh, has uh, changed his inferno. A smile. The smile of uh, Casella um, the shadow smiled as he withdrew. This is uh, the first smile since uh, Virgil smiled seeing the poets in limbo in, um, at the very beginning of, uh, of Inferno. Nobody else has been smiling since in, uh, in the poem. So a lot of things are changing and uh, if we don't stop and notice it, uh, Dante is uh, creating a change in our subconscious by including these this very little details. Dante finally speaks and uh, he calls him my own casella, casella mio. Is, there's a lot of affection in, in Italian in calling somebody mio, casella mio. Uh, per tornare altra volta, he explains uh, a little bit of, uh, about his journey and he uses the next uh, tercets to justify the fact that he has put casella right here. Because as, as we've talked about before, Time is very important in Purgatorio, and Dante is extremely punctual and precise about time. So, what a coincidence that uh, Casella decided to leave uh, the Tiber, the mouth of the Tiber, and to go to Purgatory exactly on March 25th of year 1300, when Dante finds, finds himself there. 
It's obviously a, a coincidence that Dante has forced, um, and uh, in order to make it, to justify it, Dante tells us that uh, Casella, in his explanation, says that he had died a little time before, but uh, he was hesitant, and again the sense of hesitation bef before the spiritual work, to actually go to the mouth of the Tiber and uh, make himself uh, ready to go with the angel. So in this way, uh, it's clear that Dante has almost created uh, something that can be called as a pre-ante purgatorio, which is not here in the location of the Mount of Purgatory, but uh, next to Rome, at the mouth of Tiber and Ostia, there is this pre-ante purgatory where the dead souls still linger for a while. Some of them can go immediately, or if they want, but some of them can linger in hesitation. Another important reference here is to the year 1300, when uh, Pope Boniface had um, proclaimed the Jubilee. And so as part of the Jubilee, uh, there were a lot of indulgences given to people uh, for free, which is, in our sensibility, in our uh, way to think about these indulgences, we only think about them in a negative way, something that sounds like trading, sounds like a business, which in many, many cases it was. Uh, Dante hated that. Um, Martin Luther hated it. It was a, a really bad habit. But at the same time, there is a, from Dante at least, there is still a clear uh, respect for the spiritual power of the church. Uh, the same way that we saw when he was um, describing the popes in, uh, in Inferno, he still gave us the impression that he was very respectful to the key, the key of St. Peter. Uh, he still has this, uh, uh, this deep respect for the papacy and for the church itself. And so finally we get to the second song of this canto. Um, it's Dante himself who is asking Casella to please entertain them with uh, one of his uh, sweet songs. And uh, Casella starts uh, singing Amor che nella mente mi ragiona, which was in fact a poem written by Dante that we assume that Casella had put into music and that in life Dante had uh, listened to when uh, in the presence of Casella. He knew how good what Casella was in singing, was one of the best singers of, that Dante knew. This is why he uses the word uh, dolce and dolcezza so much here to describe the this music, this uh, singing. Um, he repeats it, I believe, three times here. He started so sweetly, I still hear the sweetness sound in me. My master, I, and all that company around the singer seem so satisfied as if no other thing might touch our minds. This is not just a simple simile. He is uh, telling us something that he had already touched on in his uh, convivio where um, in the second canzone of uh, Convivio, which is in fact uh, Amor che nella mente mi ragione, this uh, canzone, uh, was written explicitly uh, by Dante in celebration of uh, Lady Philosophy, this uh, metaphorical or allegorical Lady Philosophy. Lady Philosophy had replaced Beatrice in, da in Dante's affections and uh, in a way that uh, Dante doesn't he realizes was not fair. And we will see at, uh, towards the end of Purgatorio um, how Beatrice refers to this, because at this point she knows everything about Dante's life. In his Convivio, Dante uh, said about music, music uh, pulls towards itself all human spirits um, in, uh, in a way that they are mainly vapors of the heart. In, and in a way that they almost cease any activity, any operation. It's beautiful and powerful, this type of uh, description of the way that every time that we listen to music, to beautiful music, we, all other activities of our body, soul, mind, cease because it is so magnetic and it pulls all of our vital energies away. So it's not surprising to Imagine that somebody like Dante met a celebrity 
singer in Purgatorio. Could be, for example, um, Bono from U2, let's say. You see him there and you knew him from before. So of course you want to hug him and say hi. And of course you want to hear him sing because he's such a, a great singer. Um, but this is not what Dante is there to do. This is not what he's there to do. And, and this is not the reason why all those souls are there to do. So this is uh, the reason why this uh, particular canto ends in the way that it ends. We have uh, Cato shouting and interrupting this uh, musical rapture that was going on. Um, what have we here, you laggard spirits? What, negli what negligence? What uh, lingering is this? This is a, actually a technique as well that Dante has been using before and will be used again of uh, front-loading a particular imagery that we will find in the next canto or in future canto, where we're gonna meet the late repentance uh, through negligence in all this uh, anti-purgatory. It's, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, it's not difficult to understand this type of uh, uh, position of your soul, this type of position of your inside mind and soul, because it's basically putting off spiritual work and purgatory is spiritual work because it requires prayer. Prayer in itself is work. It's uh, much easier to listen to music, even, um, let's say, Christian music or in church, etc., than to put in the work that really helps you develop and uh, evolve as a Christian uh, through prayer. Because it takes active work and not simply a passive role of somebody who's listening and enjoying. So just like uh, birds and uh, pigeons, they are scattered around by Cato and everybody runs away um, after having been scolded by, by Cato. It's a very funny almost and, uh, and strong uh, scene to close the second canto with. It's uh, really wonderful how we're, gonna, we're starting to see colors, we're starting to see smiles again, and it's gonna be gradual the way we we're gonna see this uh, type of um, enlarging of Dante's palette and colorful palette in, uh, in Purgatorio. So thank you for watching this video and I very much look forward to the next one for Canto 3.